Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How to Win Customers and Influence Google, a B2B Guide to Search and Social, sponsored by Beacon Live. Today's presenters include two professionals in the social media marketing field, Rachel Yeomans, the Social Media Marketing Director for their interactive web marketing firm, Aztec, and Sean McGinnis, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for the digital media network, 321 Digital. And for a 15-second plug, this webinar is being delivered to you using Beacon Live's webinar platform. Beacon Live partners with its customers to produce professional webinars, webcasts, and online events, specializing in the continuing education industries. Beyond providing you with our state-of-the-art technology, your dedicated Beacon Live event service producer will work with you throughout every detail of your event. When you partner with Beacon Live to deliver your online events, we become an extension of your team. A few quick notes before we begin. During the webinar, you can submit questions to the presenters in the chat section of your panel located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Rachel and Sean will review the questions at the end of the presentations. If you have technical difficulties during the course, please contact the moderator by using the chat feature. Just type your question into the chat pod and click on the blue Send Message button. It's now time to begin the course. I will turn the presentation over to Rachel. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, Sean, thank you for joining me in presenting How to Win Customers and Influence Google. Glad to be here, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, the format of how we're going to do this is uh, Sean and I will actually be touching um, points throughout the presentation back and forth and uh, just highlighting examples, going through the PowerPoint, and uh, we're very much looking forward to your questions at the conclusion. So what we'll be discussing during this hour is the process of establishing social media and growing social media for a B2B business, and then of course best practices. So we really want to highlight the A to B scenario and some examples of some things that you can do well, some things that maybe you should avoid, and of course some fun examples in between. So the first one is, this is a big one for me, is to have a plan. Whenever Social is one of those buzzwords right now, and it's not a buzzword, it is definitely very important. It's not going away, but you can't just jump into the water head first and just say, I'm going to be on social. So you open up all these social platforms, but then you have no strategy. You don't even know why you're on social. It may not even be applicable for what you're doing at this moment in time, which is, in my opinion is more dangerous than not being on social at all. So the first thing you need to do is definitely have a plan. And with that plan, you need to tie it to a business objective. So what are your goals? So do you want to sell products or services, increase website traffic? Uh, these are just a few examples of long-term goals. You can have very specific short-term goals as well based on a campaign, based on something if you have a conference coming up that you wish to promote. Whatever your goal is, make sure you establish it before you even get started. And one thing that I do really want to point out here is that at the bottom of this screen, your goal is not to increase fan page, um, fan page numbers on your Facebook page or follower account with a Twitter handle or a LinkedIn group, a Google Plus page, whatever that number is, that's not your goal. Your goal is engagement because that's what social media is. And I do want to uh, ask Sean the question that he actually put in at the bottom of the slide. Sean, what if there is no business objective when it comes yeah, to that, media? That drives me crazy. I mean, look, if, if you don't have a business objective that you're trying to drive something, uh, and whether that's an increase in something or a decrease in something, you need to have a measurable, uh, some sort of a measurable outcome that you can impact with social media. And if you don't, you probably shouldn't be there. Um, it's sort of the dirty little secret. There, you know, one of the main things that we often hear, both you and I and, and many others that I speak with in the industry is, you know, firms are jumping onto social because it's the, sort of the de rigueur thing to do. And uh, if you haven't thought it through and you haven't actually um, 
establish the metric that you're trying to influence, there's really no reason for you to be on social media. Doing it just to do it is really a recipe for disaster. Well, and there also is another bullet point. Since Sean's specialty is really in the search engine optimization side of things, which is so important because social and SEO are very often tied together, and a lot of people don't realize that. So for example, if you are active on Twitter or LinkedIn, then if someone Googles keywords that relate to your profile or your company, uh, for example, the, the LinkedIn headline is actually one of the strongest um, SEO opportunities for you. So instead of in your headline saying what your job is, you can put key, keywords in there that says speaker or CEO of um, electronic expertise or something that will pop up in Google. Because if people Google those keywords or your company name, your name would actually pop up in one of the top results. It has very strong potential. And Sean, I would like you to actually expound on how that really can increase awareness when it comes to establishing your business objectives. Sure. I mean, look, one of the, one of the things that has been happening, um, especially of late in the last 12 to 18 months or so, is Google and Bing have really started to take social signals into account when they're formulating their results. Um, that didn't used to be the case, but it's becoming more and more influential in terms of what sites or what pages get ranked in what position on, on the major search engines. And so there's opportunities to leverage um, platforms like Facebook and Twitter. And basically what you want to do is you want to create content that is shared or that is shareable, whether that's shared via email or shared via social networks. The, I mean, the, the, the principle is the same. But the sharing on social networks is having a much greater influence. Um, you know, Google Plus in particular is really in influencing Google search results these days. And so you want to leverage that. And, and that can be a business objective. I mean, a business objective isn't just sales. One of your objectives could be to drive additional SEO traffic or organic search engine traffic to your site. Uh, because you know that for every number of visitors that, that show up, uh, you get, you know, X or Y conversion rate and that leads to business or leads to sales or leads to greater engagement. That can absolutely be one of the metrics that you're trying to, to drive. Just be knowledgeable about what you're trying to drive. I think that's where, really the point of the slide. And the other um, point on that as well is you don't have to just have one objective. Like right. that's always something, you know, it's yes, you want to drive sales, but you probably also want to drive SEO traffic to your site. And you probably also want to promote this one service or product probably more so than another one. So here are some additional questions that you should ask yourself if you do have some of these goals. And I pulled a few of them on, for example, if you want to sell a product or service, okay, by what? What is your number? Everyone's always pushing that lovely acronym we focus so much on, the return on investment, the ROI. But is that ROI for you a dollar sign or is that a click-through rate? Is that additional, uh, as Sean said, SEO drive to your website? So what exactly is the measurable point within each of your goals? And the one that um, I actually really want to point out is on the second bullet point when you want to increase the, just the awareness of your brand or your company. Uh, the keywords speak very heavily in SEO, uh, but more so I wanted to speak on the editorial calendar. That is a lot of people get on social and they, they, even if they're very good on social and they're engaging and they talk to people, but they still don't really have a plan around it. I'm a big proponent of what I call the editorial calendar. And this actually applies to, it can apply to anything within your business. If you have a newsletter, if you have a blog, if you are a publishing company, you already have one of these. So you have to make sure that you tie in social. So if you use Microsoft Outlook or Google Calendar or what have you, have a specific calendar or color in there on what you're going to be talking about. And this is especially important if you have a team. And that team doesn't have to be just a social media team. It can be your community manager who's taught, who is going to be posting this week about uh, what's the theme, Sean? <laughs> uh, you caught me off guard. I, I know. I'm putting you on the spot. 
but it can be something like if you're if you have a newsletter going out um one month about SEO, that's going to be your newsletter. Like week one, you should post social media postings about um, uh, this is your wheelhouse, Sean. What is a good example of a good theme for one week to post yeah. on your? Yeah, you could if if, yeah, if we're talking about SEO, you could do an entire week's worth of posts all about how to build links. For example, you could take one topic and break it down and have a different post for each week. Um, other themes you could do, you know, how to engage with your clients or how to do X or Y or Z. It all depends on what your audience is really. So with that being said, if you have those themes within during that week, it's a great opportunity for you to not just bring forward what you may have already written about this subject. So if you have a blog or if you have a publication and you have one week about engaging with your customers, not only can you reference other publications uh, that may not know about you, and then you reach their audience, you have the opportunity of repurposing your own content. So right. that way you can post on Facebook a relevant link about this topic that you may have posted about last year. And you also have the opportunity of, again, SEO, of doing a link back. So if you have, again, a blog or what have you, an online article, that talks about what you've basically engaged on with that theme, if you have a recap post at the end of the week and include mm -hmm. links to all of your articles and maybe some others to make sure it's not too self-promotional to your content. Mm -hmm. And again, really helping with click-throughs and increasing your, again, optimization of your website, which is so important. And the other thing too is you can increase engagement. So at the Every Monday on, on your Facebook page you can post, this week we are going to be talking about how we engage with our customers. What are some of your best practices? And then people are enticed to contribute to that conversation. So that's, the editorial calendar I feel is extremely important, especially when you do research on when your audience is online, when they engage the most with your channels, and then you can make sure that you are targeting them at the right time. And again, you can just put it in your calendar like another meeting. Because Lord knows, not all of us have time to be on Facebook every day. <laughs> yeah, and the thing I love about the themed approach is, is, is you can leverage all the various different platforms. You know, don't be shy about um, finding images and uploading them to a Flickr account or creating videos that, that uh, are revolving around your theme or inviting guest bloggers to write additional blog posts that are outside of things that your team um, have published. The other thing you can do is approach people that have already published something. If you can dig up a, a post that was written maybe within the last month or two or even six months or maybe it's even a little bit older, you can approach a blogger and say, look, we'd like to republish your blog post because it, it, you know, we're, we're going to be talking all about this theme for this week or this month and we'd love to repurpose that. You know, would you allow it? We'd be happy to provide a link back to your site and it allows you to create new relationships um, but also to be seen as an expert because you're floating up authoritative content on your site. Yeah, it's such a good point about the guest bloggers. So with that being said, once you have your goals and your objectives and sort of have a, a plan mapped out, then you pick your platform. You don't need to be on every platform. If you only should have a blog, only pick a blog. If you should, if you feel that your audience is on Facebook more than Twitter, just do Facebook. You will probably end up adding social accounts as your audience grows, especially your online audience. And you can add them later, but the worst thing you can do is get on everything and only focus on one. So this does provide, provide some research. And the other question that you do need to ask yourself is, what should we be on now? But what will our clients, our customers be on in six months? Uh, for example, a lot of people think that B2B is only for uh, maybe LinkedIn. And maybe a lot of people do focus on Facebook, but the Twitter platform is growing very quickly. It's small right now, but the opportunities there are very, very high for you. And also back to LinkedIn, I think it's actually one of the strongest platforms that it's ignored. A lot of people don't. It's one of the oldest ones. Actually, I think it is probably one of the old, oldest social networks out there. 
that is extremely strong. It's extremely powerful. And a lot of businesses don't take advantage of that, especially now that you can have status updates on your LinkedIn company page. Again, when you get those LinkedIn emails every week, when you read the recaps, whose information and status update is on top. That could be your status update and your information and your company. Yeah, and I think a lot of people I know really I'm sorry. Oh no. I was gonna say I think I think that there's I think a lot of people think of LinkedIn primarily as the like a job sport, you know, a place where you can just connect with people and they forget that when LinkedIn turned on the sort of the, the news flow and the capability of posting things to your your wall, for lack of a better word, you know, stealing Facebook's lingo. Um, it's, mm -hmm. It really is an amazingly powerful opportunity. Um, I, I've seen posts um, drive more as money or more traffic from LinkedIn than any other social network. Well, and I, I also love the Flickr story that you told yeah. me the other day. And I, as video and photo are, they're so powerful right now. That's where everyone's going. So why don't you share that with with the yeah. people? Well, there's really two points to make. One is that um, uh, Google in particular, but all, really all the search engines, have what we call blended search results or universal search results. So when you run a search, um, oftentimes depending on what that search is, you'll see videos or uh, graphical images right at the top of that search result. And so there's definitely opportunities to leverage that to your benefit. Uh, think of the fact that there are billions and billions and billions of pages um, of sort of textual results that you might be com competing with in any given search, right? You be hundreds. You know, when you run a search, you see 750 million documents satisfy your query at the top of Google. There might only be a couple hundred thousand images or videos that that even potentially satisfy that query. So the the ability for you to be at the top of a search result is enhanced if you um, w treat wisely your graphical and video uh, business assets. But the, the, the direct story that we were talking about yesterday, I actually saw a great quote from, or a tweet from um, Jeff Livingston. There, you know, everyone's the, the darling of the social media sphere right now is Pinterest. Uh, if you haven't seen a Pinterest uh, post recently, just you know, stand on a corner and one will slap you in the face, I'm sure, as you're, as you're sort of standing there, it will come flying by. But, um, and Pinterest is great. I'm not belittling Pinterest in any, any way, shape, or form. But I think it was CNN or some, yeah, some major media network had, picked up, had written a story and was looking for a graphic and they grabbed a picture that Jeff Livingston had uploaded to Flickr. And his tweet was basically something along the lines of, you know, CNN grabs another, another image uh, of mine for a story. That just doesn't happen on Pinterest. And it's very true. Flickr is a great resource. People use it constantly looking for images. Um, so, you know, if you've, if you've got those types of assets that are part of your business, be sure to upload them to Flickr and tag them appropriately so people can find your content. And speaking of tagging appropriately, this is also a very good FYI for if you do have um, online content such as a blog. So if you have a, you know, a, the keywords, if you, that should be part of your plan on what are the top keywords that our audience is talking about. A really great platform which uh, we will dive a little bit into analytics later is uh, Social Bro, as funny as that name is. But it actually it's a free service. You can type in your Twitter account, and it, analyze, it analyzes a lot of things. But one thing I love, it has uh, those word clouds that actually show what your key, like the top keywords are that you're influential in through your Twitter handle. That more importantly shows what your audience is talking about by keyword. So if you include those relevant keywords in your title, in your meta description, in link backs within your blog, and tagging them. And of course, linking back to other posts, putting the keyword as um, your tags for or categories within your posts, and if you have a photo, ta um, actually putting the keyword within the name of the photo, so that again, if someone searches on Google and the images pop up, that image may pop up higher on Google Google Images. So it's a really good way to use this whole wide world of interwebs into a really cool cohesive format. So now comes the, the fun planning part. Um, the, this is a very good list of sort of questions and things to put in the back of your head on how you are going to be using these platforms. And the top one, who is the person or people who will be responsible for getting this information out there? We are all very busy and we may not have the budget 
of hiring someone full time to do this. There is definitely a strategy. I'll go back to the editorial calendar. You you really can be creative in how you engage, but you really need to assign someone who is responsible for either managing that engagement or engaging it themselves. And how often is this person going to be engaged? And again, I need to stress this. Please be realistic. And this goes towards choosing the social media platform that's right for you. So just sit down and really plan out where are the hours, where can we shimmy this around, if it's with your marketing team, if it's with your sales team, just you have a plan and figure out who's going to own this. Um, and Sean, is there a point here that you really want to kind of hone in on? No, I, I you know, so hearkening back to the um, editorial calendar, the thing that I that I really liked, I, I think it was Mark Schaefer who wrote this in a blog post one time, but it really resonated with me. And if it's not, I, I apologize for butchering who it was. But uh, whoever it was, this person had written that that one of the things he does is recommend to clients that they actually map out the the first 50 blog post titles of we're going to write this and this is the day it's going to be posted. And having that sort of level of detail um, in your editorial calendar and that level of commitment leaves little room for error and little wiggle room to sort of get out of it. I know when we started our blog uh, at Dot Co Law Marketing. Uh, I brainstormed for an hour with two other employees. We came up with 100 blog titles, and we just uploaded it, and we picked from them every week. And here's the things we're going to write about this week, and we sort of uh, rally up and talk about it. We didn't sort of get into the detail of that, but I think that's one of those really you know, powerful tips that, that you know, people can use to their benefit. It's really important to sort of have that that level of detail planned out. Yeah, and actually this brings up a point that um, we didn't put in the slide is having a social media policy. <laughs> having yeah. a plan is very important, but have a social media policy. It's, uh, there's a website, um, I'm Sean, I'm in your position now, I don't remember the name of it, but it is very strong Google, but you can actually find all the top social media policies of Best Buy and Whole Foods, and it's just all you really need to do is look at it, and you can pretty much copy and paste it and just tweak a few things that apply to your company. And if you have a lawyer, please run it by them, absolutely. But that is definitely something you should have. Um, more importantly, especially if you have multiple businesses. So if you have three businesses that do different things, but the corporate headquarters is running all the social media, you need to have a process on how those businesses work with one another and then go back to the corporate social media strategy. So it's a policy, a plan, and an internal plan and strategy for not how you talk to others, but how you talk internally and what the process of approval is. It's very, very important that you have something like that set up. I think it's socialmediagovernance.com that you're thinking of. Um, That's it. Yeah, there's a whole list yeah. of the top 40 or 50, you know, there's a couple hundred actually. It's a database of social media policies. So. Perfect. Yeah, that probably is the one then. So what is that, Sean, again, so people can get that? Social me it's socialmediagovernance.com, G-O-V-E-R-N-A-N-C-E. Fabulous. And then finally, uh, we put this down big at the bottom, is don't forget to track and measure. Again, going back to what your version of uh, return on investment is, it's important that you quantify that in whatever method that is. So we have a few examples here. Um, there are so many. I have uh, I included a link to a Google document in this slide because it's a working document. <laughs> I have been filling it out for about a year and a half now, and <laughs> it goes through the free social listening tools, the paid social listening tools, the messaging tools, the two that I the two categories that are most important for businesses is social listening and social outreach and community management. And the social listening ones, the big ones are Radian 6 and Systemos. They're the most expensive. They're the most robust. I did include a free option with social mention, which is basically you type in your whatever keyword you have. It could be a Twitter hashtag. For those who don't know what a hashtag is, it's on Twitter. It's a pound sign with a phrase behind it. Um, oh, and speaking of, the hashtag for this conference is Beacon Live Webinar if you are tweeting. I'm sorry, I completely forgot to announce that. Uh, so you can type in that hashtag and see everyone who's mentioned it, um, everyone who's talking about a specific subject. You can type in your own company name. 
you want to see what people are saying about you, about your industry, about anything that can affect you. So it's very important to just be aware. And there are many more tools out there that can provide listening capabilities. These are a few. The other one is obviously you want to talk to people, but uh, there are so many different platforms. There's Twitter, LinkedIn, there's Facebook, there's a whole bunch of other ones out there. And how do you manage all of those in one spot? These are a few, again, a few examples. Um, I personally use, um, or we at Aztec use Argyle Social. Excuse me, and it's the I really like it because it's really good for the medium-sized business. The price point is good. It isn't. It's, it isn't too much because a lot of these platforms they say, oh yeah, we work with Coke, we work with um, Chevy, and it's like, well, that's great, but I'm a medium-sized business. I need you to, to take a step back, but I also need something a bit more robust. Um, then, oh, I'm sorry, there's someone who just chatted. It is the hashtag I said is incorrect. It is Beacon Webinar. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, so hashtag Beacon Webinar if you're if you are tweeting. Um, so Argyle Social is a very good middle of the road uh, program. A lot of people also use Hootsuite, which does have an analytics program actually tied in. Uh, I love TweetDeck. It's great because uh, Twitter, as a lot of people know, it's a waterfall of tweets. And it helps you organize your tweets by, here is uh, my Twitter list of what my clients are saying on Twitter. Here is a list of what my competitors are saying on Twitter. And you can really help analyze things through a list format. Um, so for Argyle Social, it's one of the only um, platforms right now that actually works with Google Analytics. So if you have a very specific goal of increasing uh, email signups, for example, you can put that Google link, or I'm sorry, that link into your Google Analytics through Argyle Social. And then it automatically, when you schedule your tweets, your Facebook posts, it puts in tracking at the end of all those links. So if someone does sign up for an email, you can actually say that email sign up came from this specific tweet. It's really a nice way to show very detailed engagement while also showing broad engagement with graphs and charts and things like that. So um, again, I put the Google Doc in for your reference. Um, it's very good to scan. It can be overwhelming. I apologize to you in advance. So just start with these two, social listening, social outreach community management, and you can help. You can decide which one is best for you and your business goals. So when I say strategize, um, a lot of people say have a plan, have a goal, but what does that specifically mean? So I actually took two goals and gave some specific examples to see if these may relate to you and your business. And feel free to take anything that you want. But this is a, a showing of the path. I'm a big fan of not just the editorial calendar and scheduling, but the path people take to get there. So if you want to sell your product or service, you may have a campaign that says uh, it could be a live chat with an expert in the field of increasing your web traffic. So that chat is scheduled for 1 p.m. on Friday. And you market that through your social media channels. You may invest in an advertisement buy, either through Google or a Facebook buy or LinkedIn ad buy, and then through your traditional email marketing. And that could be a one-off email or included in your existing email campaigns. And then all of those lead um, I did include arrows that social media, ads, email, those all do feed into one another as well while leading to the site landing page um, on your website. It could also be a Twitter chat, which are very popular and they're growing every day. But what I like about having a landing page with a live chat is it's on your website. So you always want people to go back to your website. And then after you're done, you don't want people to leave your website. So after that, maybe you have a thank you page with um, an embedded ebook or maybe products that people can buy. And therefore, you may be increasing your profitability from, that, from this one campaign. Um, so this is kind of the layout of it. And Sean, did you have, do you want to add anything to yeah, but I think the website stuff? Yeah, I think that one of the things that's most important that when I look at the slide is, and it's sort of 
tangentially related. It's not directly related, but you know, a lot of businesses today are so enamored with you know, they hear all this the, the dramatic rise in the number of people that are on Facebook and the fact that people spend seven hours a month on Facebook and you know, it's just there's a lot of Facebook engagement and people just spend a lot of time there and, and I've heard it come up in a number of um, situations where people actually ask, well, do we really need a website anymore? Um, can't we just get by with a Facebook page? And the answer to that is uh, absolutely you need a website and uh, it probably applies less to this audience being a B2B audience than rather than a B2C audience, but I still hear it and it, and it drives me crazy. I mean, uh, it's like putting all your eggs in a basket where you have no control over what happens and I just, you know, that's, that's a recipe again for disaster in my view. I think you need to have, the, 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 your website needs to be the core, the hub and all these other outreach campaigns and channels whether they be email or social or search or PPC or whatever they are, those are all the spokes that lead out to where your clients are and, or your, your audience is and they're sort of circumnavigating you um, and, and you want to bring them into that place that you've got complete control over. Well, and I've actually heard from a lot of businesses as well, why do we need a website? We have a blog. And that is, it's one of those business decisions. If you're a content-driven organization, a custom blog may be all you need, but I'm sure almost everyone on this call already has a website and may not even have a blog. But with that point, your blog should live on your website. You should never have your blog live on a completely different URL you at least should have a redirect on your website, but that traffic needs to live on your website because it helps your traffic on your website. Otherwise, people will just go to your blog and ignore your website. And at the end of the day, that's what your pertinent information is about growing your business. So why would you want to drive people away from that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I, well, not, not okay. to cut too fine a point on it. There's, I think there's opportunities to do both. I mean, if you intertwine them together, um, and I'll give you an example. In, in a previous position I was at, we deliberately had a website and a blog separately, and we owned three or four of the top search results in our category because we had those two different properties on two different URLs. Um, it depends on the level of competition, to be sure, but it's, it goes back to my favorite answer of any question. It's, it depends. <laughs> and if you know all the facts, then you can you know, make those determinations. So I'm always scared about giving sort of black box solutions that are, that are that always always do this or always do that. Yeah. No, that, that, no. Oh my gosh, please. I love disagreement. <laughs> That's what <laughs> that makes things more interesting. Right. I, but it, it's such a good point as well from because um, for the reputation management campaigns that people go through. So um, like one that, I've, um, that I know about is the if you have some negative press going on, Usually the easiest thing to do is film a few very positive testimonial videos and post them on every single video channel imaginable. Um, right. So there is definitely something to be said about owning those multiple locations. I admit like, that is, there are times when me and SEO don't get along because some SEO best practices I feel take away from user experience because I want everything in one place. So this. That's a really good point for people on the call. Sometimes they don't marry well, and that's when you have to make your business decision. I would never want my blog away from my website, but then again, you might be hurting your business objective, as Sean pointed out. So that is a really good example of, at the end of the day, just do what's best for you and your business. Right. I agree, um, by the way, about, about the oil and water aspect of user experience in oh. SEO. I mean, I think as we, as I you and I, or as even as, our, as the folks on, on, on the call um, think of SEO, they probably have a preconceived notion of what SEO looks and feels like. And it's probably not the best um, perception. And, um, and yet, I, I, again, I disagree with a lot of that perception. I think really good SEO can and should provide a good user experience. In fact, I, my belief is that they're um, indisputably intertwined, but it's the bad SEOs out there that that spend a lot of time sort of keyword stuffing a bunch of junk into your page that it makes it sound like it was written by a third grader. You know, <laughs> that, stil that stilted copy um, subverts the conversion possibilities of any website and it drives me batty when it happens. Uh, yeah, that's, there are lots of things that I'm sure <laughs> drives both of us batty. <laughs> right. 
Um, the other uh, goal that I sort of laid out with um, a strategy was um, growing your email list. And again, a specific campaign, uh, I've seen this once and I thought it was a neat idea, is you read our emails every week, you have a strong email list, why don't you write our email for us and you have a chance to win something. So again, leading you through that process here, it's another idea of if you have a goal, how do you work yourself backwards into, excuse me, into growing that engagement? Okay, it's such a great so, concept. A cus a contest or oh. so underutilized. You know, it's a way to engage with your users, and it usually results in uh, a whole gaggle of inbound links back to your site. Um, but again, you want to make sure that you've got that contest landing page built on your site yeah. so that you can drive additional you know, page views, links, eyeballs, and everything else to the property that you control? Yeah, contests are, um, and they're usually used most by B2C, so I think some people in B2B may not be, they may not even think about it as an option. Mm -hmm. But um, they, in Blogging 101, they usually say, if you want your blog to grow quickly, have a contest every month. And right. that's the bare minimum. The one thing I will say about contests, before you go all contest crazy, if your goal is to, again, <coughs> your goal is not to increase Facebook fan page likes, but a lot of people host contests that require you to like their Facebook page. I'm just warning you now, the Facebook terms and conditions with hosting contests are very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. So. Find those terms and conditions. I can go into them now, but I won't bore you. If you want me to expound during the q and I'll be happy. But just be wary. Twitter is much easier. Blogs are great. Websites awesome. Just be wary of the Facebook contest. Right. So you're on social, and now what? So we have a few do's, which uh, are all very relevant. You want to create engaging content. And I, do, I did put in create engaging content. You, the one thing, and this is both with SEO and social, repurposing content and just duplicating content is not good all around. Um, you want your content to be authentic. You want to be the first one to talk about it. And you want to be relevant and to be shown to others that you are trustworthy and you know what you are talking about. Um, the other one too that I think is really important is um, the cross promotion. Like Sean mentioned it earlier about uh, asking people to post a blog series on your blog. Um, it doesn't have to be all about you or all from you. More importantly, bring in an outside expert. Work with a partnering company on a campaign together. Think a little. Social is kind of you have to. Be a little out of the box when it comes to social. And there's one that says take some risks and have some fun. It's really, it's really important to kind of get out of your comfort zone a little bit because social is out of a lot of people's comfort zones right now. Like you can do it well, but you can. You we're all human at the end of the day, so you want to make sure that you do have some fun with it. And Sean included a link to the Clue Train Manifesto. So can you expound on what that is for the group, Sean? Yeah, I think it's it's one of the most undervalued. I, you know, it was really important when it came out. So basically, it's a it's a set of 95 theses that were written by a small group of individuals, but it was published back in 1999, and I include it for a couple of reasons. I think um, one, if you read it, it's it's a really a short read. It's it's basically a long blog post. It was later sort of expounded upon and released as a book. You know, naturally, anything that gets a little bit of attention these days gets gets sort of uh, um, thrown and slapped into a book, but it 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 sort of it was prescient in what it observed. It, it's not. I'm not suggesting that we're here today in sort of this Web 2 almost 3.0 world because of it. But the the folks that wrote it were um, a little bit forward thinking, but also just sort of um, deeply analytical of where we were back in 1999. But I also include it in, in the event that you think that this is sort of new, and and if you think that you're coming to this for the first time, and, and B2B is at a greater risk of being in that situation than a B2C company would be. Um, you know, they tend to be a little bit later adopters, and they tend to have a little harder time speaking with that human voice because they're concerned about, well, it's a, it's a business that's buying my service. Um, but the Clue Train Manifesto begins with a, a thesis that says, 
Markets are all markets are conversations, and it goes from there. And it's a really, really interesting read. And if you sit down and actually genuinely think about it, it might actually provide you with some real, um, real insights as to how you can better market your products and services. And, it, and trust me, it applies equally in a B2B context. I see it every day, and I think it's just one of those things that everyone should read and understand um, if you're a marketer in particular uh, in this sort of social era. Awesome. It's on my reading list. I admit I have not heard of it until you told me about it the other day. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> um, this is one of my all-time favorite examples of showing that when you do make a mistake, you can really spin it into your favor. This was a, um, an example on Twitter from the American Red Cross. And the woman who is a co uh, the community manager for the Twitter handle accidentally tweeted from the Red Cross Twitter handle instead of her personal Twitter handle. And as you can read, the American Red, C Red Cross tweeted that they were going to get getting slithered, um, aka getting drunk that night. And she didn't realize that she tweeted it from the Red Cross handle. So what she did, she got a call in the middle of the night from their PR department, and they immediately took it down. But then she tweeted from her personal handle, mentioning the Red Cross handle, and she apologized, and but also made it like made it um, sort of like I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Um, but I, you know, I just, I just goofed up. Like she wasn't mean. She wasn't overly apologetic. It was very human. It was very authentic. Um, and it was approved by their PR before she put it out. And then from the Red Cross handle, they tweeted out a funny tongue-in-cheek tweet. We've deleted the rogue tweet, but rest assured, the Red Cross is sober, and we've confiscated, confiscated the keys. I love now, that. I just love it. <laughs> but in the original tweet, she didn't tag dogfish. She just mentioned them. Who The dogfish community manager of the beer created, they turned this into a contest to donate to the Red Cross by tweeting out the getting slizzard hashtag, which she tweeted out through the Red Cross handle. It was such a great campaign. It got a lot of uh, a lot of notoriety. It was published not only as a good social media case study, but also they got a lot of donations because of this. So this is a really good example of when you do make a mistake, treat it as if you are apologizing to a person. T tweet, it, uh, treat it well, and of course get, get things approved. Make sure that you are approaching your audience in the way that your audience would be expected to be approached. But don't be afraid to apologize for making a mistake or to address it. Like just sometimes you know, burying, your sand can, burying your head in the sand can be more dangerous. But Sean, you actually uh, made a great point the other day. Um, sometimes it is good to bury your head in the sand. So be wary of addressing everything. Like if someone complains um, about your company on Twitter, but they only have three followers, is it really worth stoking that fire? Like, yeah, I think that uh, you know, that. Uh, some, some people that I really, really respect um, believe that it's really important to always sort of deal with these issues as they pop up. But um, I was involved a couple years ago with a situation where you know, when you're in house and that's happening, you literally think the sky is falling and. Uh, to be brutally honest about it, I was one of the people advocating, we need, to, we need to respond, we need to respond, we need to do something, because I tend to be very social. And um, the company made the decision to basically not do that, to deal with it behind the scenes, and um, not really engage with the critics. And it went away really quickly. And I, in hindsight, I think it was the right decision. Now, I think there is a tipping point, and you know, let's just use the, what happened recently with Susan G. Komen as an example. Um, you know, that was so big, uh, I think that, that they could have and should have done a much better job of engaging with, with the issue rather quickly. For those of you that don't know about it, um, Susan G. Komen um, made some policy changes. I'm sure everyone in, in the room has seen it because it actually hit the mainstream media. And um, they, made, they defunded um, 
or they made an announcement that they were planning to defund some of the some of the grants that they were giving to Planned Parenthood, and there was a major, major backlash. Um, and they buried their head in the sand and did nothing about it for quite some time. And in hindsight, they probably should have made, made a much, much bigger and earlier outreach campaign to explain their position. It might not have helped, um, you know, given the fact, sort of the, the, the high tension situation on both sides from a political standpoint, but uh, it's an example where, you know, they, something probably should have been done quicker. So the bigger the bigger the blow up, the faster you need to be able to respond. And to do it with levity and humor the way that the Red Cross did, I think, was just awesome. Yeah, it's like I said, it's probably one of my all time favorite examples. And there are many more uh cases where, like Sean said, um there may be not uh where examples where maybe an outreach should have been made or shouldn't have been made. Lots of don't examples out there. So we wanted to highlight like one of the positive ones on how you really can spin it for your favor. And when it comes more to the whole bullet point list of don'ts, we are eating into our q and I apologize. So um, I believe this PowerPoint is downloadable, but here are just some basic bullet, bullet points. Um, we already mentioned one of them with burying your head in the sand. Um, the one thing I want to point out is it takes time. It, don't expect overnight success unless you really put a really big ad, ad buy or advertising behind it. But even then, you don't know who those people are who are liking your page or following you because it's an ad. So if you do get that and you get a huge uh, influx of people, awesome. Now make sure you keep them there and make sure that you engage with them and make them part of your community and not just the result of an advertisement. Yeah, I think the, the my favorite bullet point on that is to don't speak in a corporate voice. You know, especially important for B2B. It's it's important that you humanize your brand in some way and make sure that the people that are talking with your customers are doing so from a human perspective. No one no one likes, you know, dry, stilted, you know, co totally corporatized verbiage. Yeah. No, I don't know anyone who does. Well, and and that goes back to like you know creating your uh, creating content, creating engaging content, and that goes across yeah. every platform. If you want people to click on it, if you want people to read it, remember that they're human and they want to read something that in, entices them to open it up and read it. So here are some other good examples. I am extremely impressed with the U.S. Department of Defense on how they really showcase the um, the social media. Uh, they have everything on one tab. They explain how they use it. Everything's in one spot. It, I just think it's very, very well done. And the one, uh, the example next to it, this was, it's a very good example of, again, cross-promoting and working with other types of businesses. So with that being said, this is um, a campaign um, uh, brought to you by a, um, a champagne company, and they actually worked with Gucci on a campaign, which was then posted on a wine community site called Snooth, S N O O T H, and it's alcohol with fashion. Those two industries do seem like they would complement one another, and so they worked with them to promote a giveaway, which I thought was extremely clever and very smart. So again, thinking outside of the box. Uh, so that actually wraps up the presentation. So um, I believe we are now going to get into the question and answer portion of, the, of this. Thank you, Rachel and Sean. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please type your question into the chat box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and press the blue send message button. You are also welcome to ask questions over the telephone. Simply press star, then one on your telephone keypad. You do need to be listening on the phone to do this. To ask a question over the telephone, press star, then one. So while we wait for questions, do you have anything that you would like to add? I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, right. yeah, this is uh it was really fun putting this presentation together and um we did have a lot of information in the slides. We didn't touch on all of it. But um, I do hope that we do have some specific questions in the audience. Um, 
but I do really want to say thank you so much for your time today. I know it's Friday, middle of the day, so it really um, I'm glad that you found this important to spend your time with us. So I hope you got um, got some good information out of it. Our, next, our first chat question, what is the best way to engage Twitter followers to retweet content you have posted? That goes back to creating good content. And um, there's, um, again, like making sure that you see what your followers are talking about and you make things that are relevant. Put information out that's relevant to them. There's actually a really good. Um, uh, I believe there are several platforms that do this, where they actually analyze your. I think Social Bro is one of them. Yes, yeah, Social Bro does this, where they actually show when your tweets get the most engagement and the most retweets throughout the week. So they can actually say on Monday at 4 p.m. you are off the charts. That's when you get most of the retweets and. Um, that's when people are paying attention. So make sure that you do tweet during those times and really and focus on when your audience is online engaging with your content. And the other thing is to uh, share some love. Um, if you see something that you want to retweet, retweet that, and then people will start, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. If you engage with other people, you will get a lot more people engaging with you and mentioning you. And the blank retweet thing, it's fine. It is the equivalent of a direct quote on Twitter, but I would always add a comment. I think that is always more relevant. People pay attention. Like you can just even something as simple as "great article, thanks." Like just some a little bit of human authenticity in there is very powerful. Yeah, I think the 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 ten, the, the problem for especially B two B again. I don't want to keep you know characterizing with a too broad of a brush here, but the problem with Twitter in general is that companies engage with it as though it's just another promotional vehicle, and that's not what people are looking for. So the most important thing is to build the relationships first and give something first, and then ask for the retweet. Or you know, the more you give, the more you'll get. Um, I think that's the same in life. It's the same with it's a it's a networking opportunity. You know, you don't build a network by asking for things from people. You build a network by giving things first. And you know, what you give away will come back to you multiple fold. Our next question. Can you provide the name of the book that was mentioned earlier? Is it the Clue Train Manifesto? Is that what they're thinking? I believe I don't think that's the only I think that's the only book that we okay. mentioned. So you can go to cluetrain.com and get the crux of it. That's where the ninety five theses it was originally published as just a web page with lots and lots of comments and lots of people who sort of signed on and said, you know, yes, I agree with this. But it was later turned into a book and the book is called the, the Clue Train Manifesto. The two words smashed together, clue and train. And I think that originated from um, a comment early on about how um, there was uh, uh, someone who made a comment about what a top uh, Forbes Fortune 200 company that was falling fast out of that ranking, and the comments said something along the lines of the 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 the, tr the, the train carrying clues stopped by four times a day. They just never bothered to to answer the call. Something along those lines. That is all the questions we have today. I'd like to okay. provide the speakers a chance to give any closing comments. Well, uh, you can follow um, follow me on Twitter uh, if you so choose. And if you have any additional questions um, as well, that's a good place to reach me. It's uh, twitter.com slash Rachel Yeomans, Y-E-O-M-A-N-S. And the Aztec Twitter handle is um, Twitter.com slash Aztec Web, A S T E K W E B. And um, I'm on all the other social platforms as well, so you can easily find me. <laughs> um, so thank you again, everyone. This is a really fun time. Agreed. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well, Sean McGinnis, S E A N M C G I N N I S is my Twitter handle. Uh, and LinkedIn as well, uh, same, same name, Sean McGinnis, obviously, and Facebook. Find me, link, link in with me, um, engage with me, and I'll definitely answer any questions that you might have. Look forward to it.
And thanks, Rachel, and thanks, everyone in line. That concludes our presentation. On behalf of Rachel and Sean and Beacon Live, thank you for attending this webinar. We will now be directed to complete a quick survey asking your thoughts on the event. <laughs>